There is this guy that everyone in the Ford community knows. Let me be clear, he's not the celebrity there, he's a true legend. Now, you can try to Google him, but he hasn't an article in the Wikipedia. Worse, if you find him, it's probably the wrong person. Now, why is this guy considered a giant? Because he literally wrote the book on Ford. The one we all read. The one we still refer to 40 years later. And one of the chapters in this book was on fixed point math. Because in the old days, floating point math was not done. A dirty word. Go wash your mouth and never mention it again. Maybe his tips and tricks were just too complicated to the average reader. I don't know. But he came back with a single page article in the equally famous Four Dimensions magazine, making fixed point arithmetic a viable alternative for many floating point applications. If you take a look at the source code, it doesn't appear to be very impressive at the first sight. But actually, it's very clever, especially if you consider this was written for a 16-bit Ford. What it actually does is give you fixed point arithmetic with one ten thousandths precision, or four decimals if you prefer. And as we will see later, you can plug a lot of transcendental functions in, making it very versatile and transparent. The article states that you have to scale any fraction by ten thousand. So one half becomes five thousand. If you use old style Ford, you can even disguise it as a friction by adding a decimal point at some strategic place, like 0 0.5000. Divide it by two and you get 0.25, a quarter. Now, how does this work? We've thrown five thousand decimal on the stack. Now let's convert that to binary. Then we multiply it by 16,384 decimal, which is equivalent to a left shift 14. Finally, we divide it by 10,000 decimal. Note that we started by multiplying it by that number. Now, what we actually did was create 14 decimal places in binary. In other words, we shifted the binary dot 14 places to the left. Let's take that binary number we got. We count the bits from left to right starting with zero. Each bit represents the exponent of the power of two. But actually that's not true anymore because we shifted the cell 14 bits to the left, effectively adding a binary dot. So let's shift the cell and start counting the bits from its integer part. And let's renumber the bits from its fractional part accordingly. Now, what does that first bit of that fractional part represent? Exactly, one half. And that's what we started with. But if you paid close attention, you know there's a problem. Let's return to our 5000 in binary. And let's shift it 14 bits to the left. That doesn't fit the 16 bit number. The very system it was designed for. That's where star slash comes in. Star slash takes three numbers. The second and the third item on the stack are multiplied. And that product is an intermediate 32-bit number, which is divided by the top of the stack. And that's why this little program works. Sure, now we know why the format works. But why does the arithmetic work? Let's start with division. Because we know this. 7 divided by 2 renders 3. If we want an additional decimal in the quotient, we multiply the dividend by 10. If we want another one, we repeat that operation. That is called scaling. So, if we want to scale the dividend, we have to put in the scaling factor. But now they are in the wrong order. We have to swap them. Now we have all the items in the perfect order to apply star slash. And that's how it's done. Since the ratios are equivalent, it doesn't matter whether we start out with cells or fractions. In other words, we don't have to convert the dividend and divisor to fractions first. It will work anyway. Let's move to multiplication. Say we've scaled our dollars to cents and want to multiply two numbers. That won't work because the product will come out far too large. 
we can correct that result by dividing the product by the scaling factor. So let's throw in two scaled numbers. Now, if we add the scaling number, we're all set for star slash. No time to wallow in the mire. We're all done here. Finally, addition. Why finally? Because subtractions is just addition with an adjacent number. That's why. Let's add our two halves. And what does the result represent? One. Just as you might expect from adding two halves. And if you don't see how that's possible, remember these are two fractions. The decimal quote unquote point is here. And those were all the basic arithmetic operations. We have covered them all. You probably wonder if this was so versatile and clever, why wasn't it more popular? That's a good question. Unfortunately, the answer is quite obvious. If you reserve 14 bits for the fractional part on a 16 bit platform, that leaves you one for the integer part and one for the sign bit. So the entire range of this contraption is roughly plus or minus two. No matter how you look at it, that makes it quite an easy application. Until 46 bit architecture came along, leaving you a comfortable 32 bits to play with. So I did. Now we know what it is and how it works. Let's see what you can do with it. First of all, I made my own version of it. I alias plus and minus so I could indicate what type of operands I was working with. Second, I added a few 48 constants so I could quickly convert integers to fractions and vice versa. Third, since 48 does not have a true star slash word, I convert the multiplication and division words accordingly. Finally, I created a word that could split up a fraction into an integer and a fractional part. I don't think I ever used it, but it's there. Of course, you're still lacking a lot of useful functions like ln, exp, all the trigonometric functions, square root, you name it. So I started digging in my libraries to see if I could close that gap. Square root is easy. Just take any integer square root routine, scale it with an additional 10k and you'll be just fine. In the same 4 Dimensions magazine we find one of the best trigonometric functions implementation ever published. It is based on the Taylor series and renders very good results. On the top of that it works with 10k scaled integers, which makes interfacing with it a walk in the park. Finally the big one. Ln and exp. I owe this one to my users who tipped me off about two free to use algorithms on the web. I made a 48 version of them and you can use them in some low accuracy floating point versions. The input and output parameters are scaled a full 16 bits, which means interfacing them with this library requires multiplying or dividing them by 4, that's pretty painless. Now, all floating points in 48 are coded in high level Ford, so they're not very performant. Let's take a look on how that works out. It takes about one second. And then you get this tiny graph. This takes one hundred of a second. And it generates basically the same graph. That's quite a difference. So yes, when doing government work, this can be used as some poor man's floating point routine. But I wasn't done yet. I wrote an integer basic interpreter in 40H, much like tiny basic. So yes, obviously it doesn't support floating point. Can I replace it with this stuff? As a matter of fact, it works surprisingly well although it was much more wordy and greatly obfuscated the original formulas, it worked. Even the performance wasn't too bad on a modern machine. I have no doubt you can make a C implementation as well. I suppose most operations can even be inlined by defining them as macros. It will be lightning fast, and you won't require a math library. I think it's a great trick to have up your sleeve since it's not that hard to remember. Thank you, Leo. 
Notley or Brody wrote another book called Thinking Ford, which I have mentioned much more prominently in another video. It's on the internet for free, so I'll leave a link to it in the description. And, ending on that positive note, I'm Hans Beesmer, and this was Back and Forth.